Not yet, Stella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is Lee Davey. Welcome to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. I am Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink al alcohol and I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same. Like right now, I'm talking to Shana Wan. How are you doing, Shana? Hello, Mr. Davis. It's lovely to meet you. It's right, Mr. Davey. Da Davey that's it. Hey. And also, and also, I'm Shana like Anna and Wan like Swan. There you go. It's the worst name Shana ever. Shana Wan. Shana, Shana Wan. Not Shanna Shana One. Shanna One. Yeah. We also have Glynis on here and we have Stella. <laughs> so they're going to be listening in and maybe ask some questions later on. Okay, Shanna, one of the things about Strive, our little community of people that don't drink alcohol, which is kind of global, but has a lot of people in, from Australia on it, is we're in the business of being comfortable with feeling uncomfortable, right? Love it. So I'm going to ask you an uncomfortable question. I'm ready. Right, here's the rules. You get the opportunity to um, fold. So you don't have to answer or you don't, I'll give you a question. If you don't like the answer to it, you just say fold and you can do that twice. But on the third one, you've got to answer it. Okay? <laughs> You're with me so far? I'm 100% with you, Lee. All right, here, here are your <coughs> cat categories you can choose from. So you can have a question on career. Mm -hmm. You can have a question on family. You can have a question on relationships, you can have a question on money, or you can have a question on sex, which for some strange reason, nobody ever chooses. Um, but they're your choices, career, sex, relationships, money, or family. Okay, you know what, I'm gonna go, this is really weird and out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna go with sex because this was on my radar this week, because addiction and sex and recovery go hand in hand, and I'll they, keep it very G-rated. Let's they do, do it. They do. And uh, pe people should talk about it more often. Now, yeah. when it comes to being comfortable with being uncomfortable, you can't get more comfortable with being uncomfortable if we're talking about sex. Now, exactly. Let's have a look. Here we go. Here we go. If you had to leave your current orientation and have a gay or straight encounter, what would you want your lover to be like? <laughs> I thought we were going to ask you about my life. Okay, hang on. Um, I would want him to be exactly like my current husband, basically. Oh, so that's so easy. sweet. I'm not even joking. He's pretty perfect. All right, let me ask you another one. Sorry, guys, that's so annoyingly what annoying. Do you, what do you want more of in your sex life, but have difficulty asking for it or finding it? So this is where I'm happy to go uncomfortably. I want to learn how to be... Um, whatever I am as a grown adult sober female without the trappings of the trauma and abuse from my past. I want to know how to be free and intimate with my husband. And that's an ongoing struggle in my sobriety. It's, it's, it's incredible how much sobriety has challenged um, my intimacy. Yeah. Is that, really. is, that, is that because having sex while under the influence allows you to forget about those things and kind of, turn off your feelings well something i speak about quite often with my public advocacy is the trauma addiction connection which i know you'd be more than familiar with um and for me my first encounter was rape and then the next few were sexual assaults and so and then i turned to alcohol as a way to mute feelings and get social courage blah 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 you know walking talking cliches we've all heard how women behave promiscuously um when they've been down the path of being abused um and i i remember as i was coming through early recovery i would say to my husband i don't know how to have sober sex i don't know how to be loved i don't know how to be treated beautifully without um feeling weird about it it's 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 literally the greatest learning curve of my sober life in my in my marriage is being fully, completely present, sober, there in the moment, it, it's, it's very uncomfortable and it's taking a lot of work to learn how to be fully exposed and vulnerable. It's the most, yeah, it's how, really hard. Mm. How do you do that work, Shana? Is it simply a, a, a question of just getting in there and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it, almost like exposure theory or are you actually studying on it or doing some coaching? Uh, no, I'm trying to just follow my gut. 
um, and just work through it as a, <laughs> I'm in the habit of doing everything without help, I have to say, because we just don't <laughs> have access to decent service and support out west. Um, I could study. No, I'm just, I'm just, I just speak extremely candidly with my husband and I say, I completely love you. I'm so in love with you. And yet for me, it's, it's the most weird feeling to be completely vulnerable and exposed. And it's like, I'm shy. It's like I've gone all the way back to being the, the kid who got completely damaged way back when it's like, I've had to take it all back to ground zero and allow him to see the real full me and it's really really easily the hardest thing I've ever done it's it's harder than getting sober it's and I don't think women discuss this enough and it's a massive side effect of the trauma addiction thing and, and women get this um yeah so it's it's bloody hard it's really hard I'm not at all uninhibited I'm I'm shy and I'm nervous and I'm like a I'm like a little virgin bride. It's ridiculous. I've gone from being this crazy promiscuous woman because the real me was never there. So now the real me is here. And as I'm into year, you know, 4.8 or whatever I am of my sobriety, it's like, oh, there's no more hiding. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a revelation, Lee. It's a constant revelation. I mean, that, yeah. that goes back to the first question when we said, you know, if you could have a different or sexual orientation, who would you pick? And you said, I would pick my husband. I mean, that's a really important point because if you suddenly switch, especially in something like sex, which for, which for being a man is like super important, right? Like I have to have sex. Now, if your partner then suddenly shifts and they, they don't want as much sex or sex is going to be different because, you know, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're having to uh, think about what you look like, your body, um, your, your thoughts race back to those earlier traumatic events that happened in your life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you need a man who really sees you and really hears you in that moment to show up for you. I, I can imagine a younger me like not getting that at all and really yeah. being pushy and selfish. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I was, and, and it's just so interesting because literally this week just gone, Timbo and I were talking about how um, he has found and revealed and dug out, and like God knows how, the man is a saint, he's so patient. Um, there's a very, very feminine person within me, and that was hidden, honestly, for the longest time, for 20 years, because I, because I grew up and worked and had to climb the corporate ladder in a very male-dominated industry. And Glennis would understand this, when you're in the bush and when you're in the outback, you gotta work like the boys, drink like the boys, smoke like the boys. Oh, it's ridiculous. Well, that's what it was like for me anyway, growing, you know, going through corporate life in the 90s. Um, and so I had to kind of work on the masculine side of me, or I felt I did to fit in. Whereas now, it turns out I'm a closet feminine human. I love it. Like I dress pretty and I have, I'm really embracing the feminine side of me and the soft side of me. And, and, and I'm really embracing the masculinity of my husband and his role as a strong, manly man. Like, it's a it's really interesting bunch of revelations. I love it. I'm very grateful for that because I think I could have very easily become one of those very aggressive, overtly, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say feminist, but you know what I'm saying? Those really mm. angry women who claim that they're all um, liberated, inspired, but they're just so angry. <laughs> And I'm very grateful that I've chosen to bring back the soft side of me that was buried for such a long, 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 long time. So I'm really loving embracing traditional masculinity and femininity. And I'm like, I love that my husband's a manly man and I love that I can be feminine. I'm 100% down with it. I love it. We were, work yeah. we were actually talking on Strive recently around what do you do when you stop drinking alcohol? So you've stopped, um, but you're your husband in this case, your husband comes home and your husband wants sex, but he's drunk. Like, like oh, where do we go? Through. So, so yeah, what's your, what's your thoughts and feelings uh, on that? Uh, so when, when I got sober, we um, created some new rules in our home. And um, basically if Tim, Timbo, cause he still drinks, cause he, he's not, you know, someone who went through alcoholism. Mm. He, um, he, 
I totally embrace and encourage him to do live his best blokey bloke life. And if he wants to go and have a few beers with his mates, I'm like, knock yourself out. Come home with your undies on your head. I don't care, whatever. Not that he would do that, mind you. He's not yeah, a crazy yeah. guy. But the rules in our house are is if he's had a few beers, then straight to his bedroom, big fella. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the limit is six. The limit is six and there's no, because um, after that, I find the smell really offensive, which is so hypocritical, I know, but. Yeah, so we just, he just knows, he's like, Sue, sweetheart, I'm off to the spare room. <laughs> is, it, is, it good, is it good that it do it's those boundaries? Because, of course, one of the consequences of drinking alcohol is you, you, your inhibitions drop and you, you suddenly are more capable of bashing up people's boundaries. I mean, how is he around that kind of thing? It's amazing, I'm sorry to say. The guy's ridiculous. Every now and then, if he's really got a, <laughs> if he's had fair few, He'll stand looking forlorn at the door and I'll go, off you go, mate. You know where the spare room is. And he, goes, <laughs> and he forgets and he goes, oh, but I'm your husband. And I go, mate, off you trot. You know the deal? And he goes, oh, and he looks a bit sad. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, uh, let's pause on this point because I think it's a really important point. Um, <laughs> reading through your story, one of the issues that exists in your part of the world are these stereotypes, very masculine stereotypes mm. around an alcohol about how you should behave and so forth. But of course, you can also take that into your household as well, can't you? And say the stereotype is, I will sleep with my woman, right? And I, <laughs> I, I always remember with my, my first wife, um, who carried on drinking when I stopped, I said to her, I was more extreme in you. I said, you don't come home. Like the, the only time you come home is if your mum... So I'm not homeless. Go go and stay at your mum's. So if you yeah, go, yeah, yeah. if you're going out on Saturday night, arrange beforehand you're sleeping at your mum's. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. And and occasionally she would turn up, and I'd be like, "Come on, I'm taking you down your mum's," because I didn't want to. I didn't want to inflame an order. You know, that was an issue. Like me being sober and her drinking was an issue. So I didn't want the clash in that space. You know, but yeah. it did. It did because her drinking obviously sounds like there's a lot more than Timbo, it does, it did lead to eventual fracture because you, uh, you know, yeah. if you drink more and more and more, you're not going to, you, you're going to be more and more and more disconnected if I've got those boundaries in place. Yeah. So it sounds like you've got a good balance. Yeah. Look, we, I am very, very, very fortunate because um, Timmy and I have a, a shared faith and a shared vision as to what sobriety was going to be and look like. And we lay the ground rules down early in the piece and they were non-negotiable. And he's, he's really great about that. And it's, I, I swear he's not perfect, ladies. He does do annoying stuff. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it was non-negotiable. So it's been a really critical part. It's, it's quite extraordinary, actually. These last five years of sobriety, I've had to learn about boundaries. I've had to learn about keeping promises. Um, Oh, just, you know, I don't know about you, Lee, but I feel like I've grown up 25 years worth in five. Like just all of these things have just fallen into place and I'm like a proper adult and mm -hmm. he's a proper adult. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very cool. We're well on the road to repair with all of that. So, yeah. It's, 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 almost, it's almost like the scene in The Matrix where Keanu Reeves is first introduced with the fact they say, Let, let's teach you Kung Fu. And then they stick the thing in his back and they just download information into his head. And then he's yeah. like, whoa, uh, uh, give me more. And they just boom. And then just like, it's just information just flying into his head. And for me, when you stop drinking alcohol, that's what happens. You develop that clarity. You see things differently and you just, you can't stop thinking. And, and I think that's a positive thing. A lot of people get it. It's scared. amazing. It's amazing. Like, um, it's really hard not to get evangelistic, isn't it? Like, I have to constantly keep myself, um, I've got to try and be less zealous at times because I'm like, you don't even understand. <laughs> Sobriety is so good. <laughs> your brain works. Your adulting works. Everything, it, it is. It's like, and you know, Lee, you'll appreciate this because you're, you're a rebel like me and you believe in sobriety. Ugh, radical, right? Um, I remember one of the most disheartening things I heard early on from a certain um, group of recovery people was, don't worry, the pink cloud will vanish. You're just, you're just in fairyland. That'll go soon enough. And I'm like, actually, bugger off. It never has gone. How, don't speak that over me. Like, I, I rebuke that, actually, because for me, the pink cloud, which, girls, I don't know if you've heard of the pink cloud, but it's, um, 
often people in early sobriety get this high of all these revelations and these beautiful feelings and blah, blah, blah. And there can be a crash for some, but I believe that crash doesn't come because the amazingness doesn't continue. It's because people aren't doing the work to, you know, continue growing and developing and changing. It's, um, for me, I've never stopped striving for that and working, you know, and, and always prioritising my sobriety. And I'm still on the cloud, man. <laughs> I'm not Long saying that. that. Hey. Long may that cloud continue. I, oh. I, you, you, did cover, you did cover it there quite nicely, actually, and, and it's worth uh, reiterating it or cementing it for the listeners here, is we do get people on Strive, actually. They come to Strive and they stop drinking and they'll say, do you know what? I thought I would get this energy. I thought that I would look in the mirror and, and, and look like super sexy. I mean, like, <laughs> what, what has happened? And in a way, that is partly resistance kind of working its way to tell you to go back drinking because this is not really worth it. But the reason you, you haven't jumped on your pink cloud or your pink cloud has dissipated very quickly is you're not doing the work, folks. Like, yeah. and what I mean by doing the work is um, when Shana stopped drinking alcohol, uh, somewhere along the, on the way, she decided to uh, create her, uh, her movement, which is now turning into a nonprofit. So she's, she's keeping wheeling, she's keeping mm. greasing the wheels, right? For me, um, as soon as I stopped drinking alcohol, I quit my 20 year career on the railway and created this podcast, right? Um, so if you stop drinking alcohol and nothing else in your life changes, guess what? I can tell you right now what's going to happen. You'll fucking hate it. You'll hate it. <laughs> and you'll want to go back and drink. End of, yeah. like, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, Lee. And, and this is what I say to people. Um, and again, you know, you don't want to sound like a know-it-all. You don't want to sound like a, a evangelical, bloody born again person, but it's the truth. And um, uh, it, it became completely essential for me. Like I sat down when I got sober, like sober in the country and creating a national not-for-profit charity was beyond anything I could have imagined. But in the early days, I sat down and I thought, righto, bloody hell, you're a nearly 40-year-old chick in Outback Australia. What the hell are you going to do with your life? <laughs> you can't have kids. And I sat down and I was like, okay, I understand fully that I have gifts in communication. I have gifts in speaking. I've got an Australia-wide network. I'm a covered alcoholic. Hmm, I am, I'm really good at being relatable. What the bloody hell can I do here? And I literally set about to make... And it sounds so cheesy, but I thought, I want to make my future count. I mean, I should be six foot under. Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. I'm going to just set about paying it forward and helping people. And it sounds like a Mary Poppins bloody diatribe, but it's simply the truth. I literally felt mandated to pay a miracle forward. And every time people say, oh, my God, you're so amazing we're so grateful for you i go ah, i'm not even amazing i'm just a garden variety bloody person who went down the path and you know i was very lucky to come into a full recovery and i need and these these all sound like cliches but these people who i help and speak with across australia they give me life's purpose it's it's stupid how grateful like I'm so genuinely grateful Lee, for my life now i am so stupidly grateful and and in addition to working really hard on my sobriety, I work on gratitude all the time. Like, it's, it's really funny. I take my little cattle dog for a walk every day and I literally speak gratitude. I'm like, thank you for the trees, thank you for the sky, thank you for the breath in my lungs, blah, 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 blah. I speak gratitude and I consciously make myself do it, especially on days where I'm being, where I'm being a negative, whingy jerk. Because I still have those days. There are still some really hard things going on in my life that really mess with my head. Financial security is a massive one. I'm five years without an income. Mm. It's bloody hard. It's hard going. But I keep thinking, well, your husband supports you. You've got a roof over, roof over your head, food in your stomach. You're bloody better. You're better off than 90% of the people in the globe. Have a perspective check. Keep going. Harden up. Off you go. <laughs> so gratitude and work, it just... I don't know. I just choose to be. I choose every day to to do what I'm doing. Um, yeah, I think cho choices choices are really important. You know, in in this kind of journey that we're all on, like um, 
realize and understand that we do get to make a choice no matter who we are or where we live in the world because mm. you know we can make a choice that's really super important and then the other uh, important piece is taking action you know yeah. so um when people come to you and they say oh my god you're you're rocking my world you save my life or or whatever and then you very humbly are like well i'm just this chick from the outback you know yeah. Um, There's nothing unique but, about me. That's but sure. you, but yeah. you've taken considerable action, which which a lot of people are unable to do. Mm. You know, so so let's say Timbo wasn't supportive of your, and I love the way you said our sobriety journey. The guy's still drinking, but you said our sobriety journey because it's because you're in this as a partnership, right? Now, uh, if he was not like that, and he was just like, that's your journey. It's not my journey. I get, I get the feeling you would take action to deal with that. Yeah, look, I, and it's interesting, um, when, um, and, and I, I don't ever claim to be an expert, right? I just claim to be an, a, a, a former alcoholic who now facilitates connections across the bush. Never claim to have the answers or be the expert because I'm not, I'm just me. But we humbly and respectfully suggest things to people. And, you know, um, when you've got someone brand new to sobriety and their spouse won't support it, I can't imagine anything more horrifying. And I'll say to people, listen, this is potentially a life and death situation for you. If Tim hadn't been on board with this, I guess I would have had to leave. I, I, I would have died had he not. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's really funny. We had a very specific strategy going in. We spent, year number one with not a drop of alcohol anywhere near our home sorry years number one and two and we said to people please come visit us we'd love to see you but do not bring grog and if we come to visit you please don't have grog we just got to get through learning to walk again here guys and our true friends were like no bloody worries easy what else can we do beautiful year number three i would go somewhere with tim and he'd say do you mind if i have a drink and i'm like no i feel fine tonight thank you sweetheart but we always had an exit strategy. We always planned. We were always very communicative and respectful of each other's boundaries and needs. Um, yeah, and, and, and it has been a journey together. And, you know, one of the most important things about my advocacy now at a national level, I'll often Instagram a photo of Timbo with a beer and me with a soda water. And I go, I don't know if you guys have seen me be a smart ass online. And I go, whoa, hold the phone. Is that Tim Warner having a beer with his sobriety ambassador wife? Yes, it is. Why? Because we don't demonise people who enjoy a drink. We are here to support blah, 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 those who can't, you know. Because it's not about condemning people. It's about supporting people's right to bloody be who they've got to be and do whatever they've got to do. And today in our house, Lee, I've got a fridge with beers in it and a cupboard with scotch in it for Tim's mm -hmm. colleagues when they call in and... I myself am fully free from booze. It's like choosing gluten-free bread or just going, no thanks. It's just irrelevant to me now. It holds no power and no sway in my life, which is an absolute miracle. Yeah. But I would not do that if I didn't feel safe. You, I would, you would you, never. You wouldn't, yeah. believe, you wouldn't believe, Shana, how many people on Strive couldn't even approach their husband and ask him not to have alcohol in the house. Like to, to me, to me, it would be a non-negotiable. It would be, um, I mean, first and foremost, let's, let's break this down a little bit. I've just been talking this, talking about this actually to Nonna Jordan, who was uh, another someone I interviewed just before I, I interviewed you. Um, first of all, like let's get, let's get real here. Men here have a massive, massive important role uh, to play when it comes to, uh, females wanted to stop drinking alcohol and a lot of the times men won't understand what supporting you looks like so a lot of the times uh, the guy might turn around and say oh you haven't got a problem uh, just have a drink oh you really deserve it now that's not your guy being a dick that's the guy thinking he knows how to support you because he's trying to get you to see there's nothing wrong with you so you feel better yes. or he just really hasn't got a clue how to help you. And I tell you, being a man who's married and has been married twice, I, my number one goal on life is to, is to look after my woman, right? If I don't know how to look after my woman, who am I? Like that strips me of my masculinity. So if you suddenly turn around and say to me that you've got a problem that I don't understand, I'm going to be a wreck. and I'm not going to know how to deal with it. And do you know how I will deal with it? 
with anger, with frustration, with defensiveness, with alienation, and I will push you away. And it's not because I want to push you away. So I think the women need to um, stand up here and, and, and wag the finger in the guy's face somehow and say, hey, wake up. This is super important to me. This is how I want to be supported. I don't want no alcohol in my house for a year. None. Zippo. And if yeah. you are my man and you took those vows, you yeah. won't even debate this. Yeah. A hundred percent. And and I reckon one of the key issues around alcohol addiction, abuse, misuse, ism, whatever you want to call it. I know people have controversy about what they even call this bloody thing. I just but education and conversation is critical. It's so critical. And I find that even talking to everyday Aussies and saying there's a few things that happen, right, when you declare that you have to stay sober and it's non-negotiable. People can be uncomfortable because they don't understand it. That's one 100% major issue. The other thing is they also have their own problem, which they don't want to deal with or are not ready to look at. So they're very profoundly discomforted by, oh, that's my alarm. Um, so they're discomforted by the notion that their former massive binge drinking buddy or spouse or whatever is suddenly going sober and it's like, I don't like this. I'm not okay with it. So they kick back. It's like bloody high school never ending. You know, it's yeah, like a rebellion yeah. from them to you. Um, and, and yeah, I totally, what you said just before, um, um, a bloke feels like they need to want to solve things. And again, in Australia, and I'm, I'm sure in the UK, wherever, we don't even know what the hell unacceptable levels of drinking even are. Because most, most like Australia is basically an alcoholic. <laughs> Un unacceptable levels of drinking in the UK are acceptable levels of drinking in the UK. They, they, I, I remember yeah. coming to America. I remember coming to America and somebody telling me that they had a drink problem, and I, I kind of laughed because I was like, "You fucking kidding me!" Like that was my Tuesday night, <laughs> and, I, and I would still come home like normal. Like, it, it, and I find strong parallels between Australia and the UK, to be honest. Oh, so, I like, see. I didn't, I didn't grew up in the outback. I grew up in a little Welsh uh, valley with uh, three and a half thousand people in, but we hit it hard. Like, and, and you're very proud to be a valley boy, but suddenly you were very proud to be a valley girl. So you needed to work as hard as a man, drink as hard as a man, have sex as hard as a man, like be as promiscuous. Um, like you had to do everything that a man did to live up to this stereotype of being the valley girl. So I, I see like yeah. big parallels other than the fact that um, you're so distanced from everything yeah. that, that that help isn't there. But on the same turn, and, and Stella will say this, it's not easy to find help, the right help, even in the UK with the National Health Service because people don't know what they're on about. And that's it. And uh, when, when you're a nation glorifies and identifies by your ability to drink, someone like you or I going against the grain and against the lemmings running off the cliff, we're like, Ugh, people can't cope. It's like, but hang on, you know, We've spent our whole lives being told that we are Aussies if we can sink a carton of VB on a weekend with our mates. And sorry, that's a horrendous beer in Australia. It's disgusting. Um, isn't it, girls? <laughs> um, you know, and it's just bizarre. Like, you, oh, oh, God, Lee, I, I get so, I get so um, overwhelmed with the insanity of our alcohol culture. And I'll often say to friends, imagine if we had methamphetamine pop-up shops, shops on every corner going two for one hits, mm. awesome deals, right? We, we literally continue forgetting that alcohol is a friggin' addictive, deadly drug. Yeah. We conveniently push that aside, promote it in sport, promote it nationally, promote it through our sporting heroes. All of our national heroes are happy to inadvertently or intentionally promote their beer drinking prowess. Um, and we're still not bloody tackling alcohol as the, the friggin' deadly disease, uh, sorry, the deadly addictive drug it can potentially be. So we're sort of starting from ground zero and I'm like, it's 2019, what the F is going on? Like we've really... It's because, I mean, I mean anyway. people, people just love getting off their tits, don't they? So, you know, even in the years of like, you know, pro even in the years of prohibition, like, you know, you know, I read a 
massive tomb on prohibition and like if you ban it everyone's just going to do everything they can to go get it because they want to just get off their face i mean I want to ask you a question, Shana. When um... I know, and don't don't laugh at me. I'm not ignoring you. Wait there. I'm going to send a message to my husband saying, "Coffee, please," so he can do a cameo. <laughs> we'll get him Sorry, on yeah. it. We'll yeah. get him on it. I I was thinking we should interview him. Um, it's beautiful. When you when you first stopped drinking or you made that decision, how how did you find? talking to people about it because I, I assume you're going to go out you can have a drink with people and they're going to say do you want to drink you can say no and they'll be like what you don't want to drink how did you deal with that <clears throat> yeah it's do you know it's interesting you should ask that the other day a memory popped up in my news feed god bless facebook and it said um it was really funny i went undercover as a health convert in the early couple of years i was like um I wasn't comfortable discussing that I had chosen to be sober because I had been a raging alcoholic. I was like, oh yeah, so guys, I'm like on a health kick. And I was really vague and blonde about it. And um, <laughs> people were saying, oh, you look well, you look healthy. I'm going, yeah, thanks guys. I've been eating kale and running and <laughs> <laughs> not saying, yeah, I've been, I got off the smokes and stopped drinking 17 litres of wine a week. Um, I was really uncomfortable being up front. I really was. And even though I knew from day one that I was going to do everything I could to help people one day, I also knew I was like a beginner on trainer wheels, immature, inexperienced, bloody hopeless. And I knew I had to take things very steadily and figure it out. And I thank God I had enough common sense to go, just cool your jets, big girl. You're going to have to just do this. Just, just take it easy, big girl. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> so I did, you know, and, um, eventually i started going oh, i've actually given up alcohol people are like what and then you know anyway so shanna from ground zero to shanna now it's like going from completely embarrassed and humiliated to tell anyone i was sober to evangelizing on a global level <laughs> um yeah so it was a weird transition i'm not gonna lie like i felt awkward i felt weird i felt um it was just friggin' weird because my entire identity for a lifetime as a country girl had been in being the piss head, mm. the party girl, um, the girl who would get up and dance on a bar or like his, one of my mad skills as an alcoholic was I could out, I don't know, do you call it sculling when you're down a beer quickly? What do you call it? We just call it neck, just neck in a pint where I am. Yeah. So I can neck a pint quicker than most Australian men. And that was a great party trick. Like, I'm not even joking. I was, I was just, I had some real talent in this space, let me tell you. You know, so my talent is this, I used to, I now call it, you know, I was like a performing circus monkey. Mm. I used to just do whatever the hell anyone dared me to when I was out on the booze. So it was like, oh, who am I, who even am I as a non-drinker? What the hell? It was very weird. So it took some getting used to. So your, if, advice, your advice to people then is, um, just go with your gut, I guess. And then if, if like for me, for example, when I stopped, I was already quite a confident in your face kind of guy. So I had like tremendous pride in what I'd done. And I, this, yeah. this, there was this part of me that was just like, wanted to stick two fingers up. I wanted to confront people who wanted to confront me. But, <laughs> but, but if you're not, if you're not like that, what Sean is saying is just take your time. And, um, and, and, and there's not a one size fits all no. rule to how you come out. I don't but, believe there but, is at all. But, Shana, but uh, I'll put a button in there and, and, and leave this with you. How important is it that you do come out? Because imagine, oh. imagine if you kept on the kale story forever. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I often, I love, love, love nothing more than when I'm sharing a talk is to say to people, like I'll, I might be doing a keynote in front of a crowd and I'll say, right, who's got a gay friend? And, of course, everyone puts their hand up and I'm like, who's been at the coming out party of their gay friend and about half the crowd leaves their hand up. And I'm like, what was it like when your mate sat down and called you all to dinner and goes, ching, 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 and says, hi guys. So I've got something I need to tell you. Awkward silence. I'm gay. And everyone goes, oh, for God's sake, we've all known this for a decade, you wanker. Pass the salt. <laughs> right. No big deal. We know this. And I'm like, that's exactly what coming out as an alcoholic was like for me. Right. Everyone's like, well done, you dickhead. We've all known this for right, years. Right, right. Thank God you're finally just saying it. Thank God you're finally putting a name on this thing so that we can bloody get behind you and help you and support you. 
So yes, to me, coming out is the ultimate freedom that you will give yourself. It is so beautiful. Is that you, husband? Yeah. Come in. You need to do a cameo. Timbo. <laughs> Everyone wants to meet you, babe. Wait for this. Wait for this handsome looking rooster. Handsome looking rooster. There he is. Hey, Timbo. <laughs> Come How are you doing? Yeah, I'm going all right. He's bringing me coffee because that's the kind of legend he is. Timbo, my name's Lee. And we've, this we've is just... Timbo, everyone. Oh. Isn't he divine? He needs a Where are we looking at? Looking wherever, oh, man. Yeah, there's a camera there. <laughs> hey, Timbo. I'm, my name's Lee, and uh, I've <laughs> just been asking your darling wife some questions about how she uh, stopped drinking alcohol. And you came up as being uh, a pivotal uh, person uh, in her life. And I just want to acknowledge you uh, and say, as someone who's, who leads a community of people who are struggling to get free of alcoholism, people like you are in short supply. And what I mean by that is men who realize and understand how important their wife is for them and are willing to make sacrifices and do whatever it takes for them to be happy. Um, and I just want to honor you for that. And uh, thank yeah, you because you're in short supply, you know. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Right, I've got a deck of cards here, relationships. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. You can say fold. I'll let you fold twice, but you've got to ask the answer the third one, okay? Because right. And the reason I'm asking you questions on relationships is I want people listening in to kind of figure out how you think about relationships because obviously most people here now would want their men to think like you. So here you go. He's pretty great, girls. Who's the audience here again? Our audience. Who is our audience, Lee? Everyone. Our audience are a bunch of pissheads trying to get sober. That's our audience. <laughs> Stella uh, and Chris. What do and you most? What do you most unfairly blame Shana for? That's a good question. Um, you better watch it. Unfairly. <laughs> I've never thought about it, to be honest. Um, you can fold. Put me on the spot. Too hard. I most unfairly blame you for. Um, Do you want to go to the next one? Yeah, go to the next That's one. That's a hard I'll question. Think about go to the next one. What mistakes would you want to avoid in a future relationship? Um, well, depends if uh, that person was an alcoholic or not. <laughs> 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 um, if if I if I knew what I know now. I would totally change the way that I dealt with it because, you know, I didn't know, didn't know how to deal with it for the first 10 years or eight years or whatever it was. So, you know, straight away, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd um, treat it with a lot more respect and a lot more, um, a lot more love and kindness rather than trying to fight it. So that's, that's certainly the case. That's because really yeah, yeah, I mean, most people don't understand don't actually understand that someone with uh, with alcoholism can't actually, it's not that easy just to stop. And that's the, the frustration of the partner is you actually think that that's all I have to do. You know, why don't you stop? And, and you just keep banging your head against the wall. So mm -hmm. simple as that. Yeah. Actually, when, when, if I may share, because this is a really powerful part of our turning point together was my rock bottom was when I fell down a flight of stairs woke up in emergency and this fellow was there in the hospital the next morning. It was bloody awful. Um, and I remember when we finally got back home and I was lying in bed and I was coming out of my stupor and I was like, oh, shit, oh, shit, what have I done? Like I was just, oh, I was just, oh, there are no words to describe my shame and guilt. And Timbo's normal practice would have been to say, sweetheart, why would you do this? Why can't you stop for me? Blah, blah. You know, all the questions that anyone who doesn't understand this disease would ask. It's fair enough. Hmm. But that particular day, Timbo leaned over and he just tucked a strand of hair behind my ear and he stroked my face and he said, you can't actually help this, can you, sweetheart? And I literally, it opened something up in me. And his compassion in that moment, I reckon, broke down a very, very big part of my wall because I was able to say, no, I don't think I can. I don't think I can. Um, and it was not long after that I finally got successfully sober. Um, but, yeah, when 
it wasn't like he was going to make excuses for poor choices. But once we had an education and some information around the fact that I wasn't a shit person, I was just a desperately sick person. And then we could go together forward. God, it was just, but that was a real, I'll never forget that moment because I was waiting. I was waiting for the condemn, com, bleh, condemnation. And instead, I got love and it broke me wide open. Mm. It was pretty beautiful. I, yeah. just had a, I just had a therapy session and the, the therapist I was working with was using tarot cards and, and I was talking about my anger and how, how my wife can feel like I'm dismissing something that she's telling me that's important because I've got other big things on my mind, right? And the tarot card was the guardian of hearts. And she was like, why don't you become the guardian of hearts and start protecting your wife's heart? And then it just, it was like a shift. I went downstairs immediately and I was like, I'm so sorry. You know, I can, I can like, I'm going to kind of like get into this mindset of seeing you more, hearing you more, trying to, yep. not trying to make everything a battle. Like just, just, just think to yourself, like, would I get into a battle with Shana and Timbo on the podcast? No, I would use my communication skills to navigate it. So it didn't turn out to mm. be a, a raging mess. So do the same in your relationships. Um, do you have, do you have, do you have 10 minutes, Tim? Um, I guess so. I guess so. I tell you, what I'm gonna, no, what I'm going to do, I'm going to unmute Glynis and I'm going to unmute Stella. Uh, I think that it would be good to open up to questions mm. and uh, they could also ask Tim some questions. Very, because, very yeah, cool. sure. Yeah, no, because um, um, Glynis, oh, I think we might have lost Glynis. No, Glynis is there or is no, she? Oh, she's frozen. She might come back. Stella, do you have any questions that you want to ask Timbo or Shana? I never, I never thought about um, until Shana jumped in on Tim's qu question and answer because obviously they were together when, when she said that he just said you can't, you can't help what you do and I can't remember when I was unless I look at the message it's irrelevant really but my husband actually asked me and I'd forgotten about this until then if I suffered from PTSD. And at the time when he asked me, I thought, you cheeky bastard. How dare you ask me such a question? What? What, what would you know? I don't know what made me think awful like that. When really, it, it made a lump come in my throat when he, he said, she said that about him. Because Lee Allen really meant that, didn't he? He, he meant it kindly. Yeah, he didn't know. Really he, yeah, he didn't. He didn't know how to help you. No. He didn't know what words to use. He felt helpless and he just goes, Bleh. did you suffer yeah. from PTSD? Yeah. <laughs> did you suffer from PTSD? Which, hurt, which like, hurts you. Oh. <laughs> but now I'm listening to them two talking and I'm filling up thinking, oh my God, he was really trying hard. But hey, yeah. um, this is all learning. <laughs> well, now you can go back and give him a hug. Because, because those, 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 I, I think that that's really important. I don't think there's anything wrong with going downstairs and saying five years ago when you said this, I fucked yeah. up a little bit and I want, I want to recognize you for what you were trying to do back then and give him a hug because I, if he's like me and he's a bloke, he's <laughs> hung on to that. That could be 50 years ago. And he's thinking, ah, I'm going to care for that. So yeah. I don't know. Do you know sorry. Sorry, Stella. Go on, no. Oh, it's just, it's really interesting. Like when people, um, again, you know, the education thing, people don't know what they don't know. And I can't even keep track of how many people have said to Timmy and I in the last five years, so hang on, you, you got sober without a support network? Huh? Yeah. How's that even possible? People cannot fathom the notion that I was able to get successfully sober without recovery group meetings, without a bloody counsellor, without anything. And I did. I, I've had no support, which is why I created Sober in the Country. So people have a community. But, um, you know, um, I believe with education and real talk so that our spouses, so that these people understand, these beautiful people in our lives who love us, they... Um, they need to be as informed as what we are. 
there's such a gap in that as well, don't you reckon? Well, that he 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 is your yeah. support network, isn't he? And and you know, it's like Mike Mike said when he first joined Strive. You know, Mike said um, there needs to be an area on here for our uh, siblings or our husbands or our wives, so they can actually come and they can kind of learn a condensed mm. uh, version of the Strive program. And for me to just say, hey you know, this is what's going on in your partner's life right now. And this is how you can show up for them. You know, yeah. I, so we're going to work on that in the future. Um, Glynis, I'm just going to unmute you. I know it's probably going to be a little bit windy out there. Um, I wanted to bring you in because uh, Tim's here and he's going to stick around for 10 minutes. Uh, I know you, your partner still drinks. You don't drink. So if you get any questions, you want to ask Tim while we got him here on, <clears throat> on, you know, how to work with a partner who's not quite seeing you. Oh, well, Tim, you're so supportive of Shanna's journey, and I just think you're a rock star as well. Um, yeah, we have a little bit of a, we've got a thing at Strive that we call the death effect. And Lee, this is a good time to mention, um, you know, you're trying to explain to somebody, and that person could be a spouse, or it could be a sister or brother or whomever, and they just don't get it. So I'm at the stage where I've, I've, I've stopped talking about it. I'm on my own journey and thank God I've got the people like I follow Shanna on Instagram. I see what she's doing in the country. I've, obviously I'm on Strive all the time and I've got a few other sober tools but for somebody that just doesn't get it, I don't know if, but I don't know if, if they ever do get it. You know, like Tim, you, you didn't have the alcoholism but you still drink. How do you get it? How do you, how do you really understand what Shanna went through? Yeah, it's a um, question, and it's I reckon it's um, it's hard to answer. It's it's really um, you know, we I was in the middle of this thing for you know, it was in terms of Shannon's problem. I was in the middle of that for a long time without actually really knowing what the problem was. Like you know, yeah, I, you know, a lot of people around me were saying, "Oh, she's an alcoholic," and you know, and leave. Yeah, leave, leave, or whatever. So you got all this pressure, as you would know. There's all this pressure on you um, from from all angles. So all, your family, you feel you feel a lot of weight from your family on you. I reckon going, you know, um, they're they're trying to be nice, but it's actually uh, making things harder for you in a lot of ways. Um, just the way they're dealing with it, and then friends as well. Friends that you know they mean well, but they're actually making it hard for you as as the partner. Um, yeah. So, in answer to your question, it's really hard. Like you, you don't, if you don't understand it, you don't really know what to do, and it, it's tough. Like it's you're in no man's land in a way. So, I think um, the key moment um, came when when Shan actually was able to um, realize for herself and surrender to the fact that she was an alcoholic that. You know, I didn't really get it until that point either, you know, because we were battling this thing together, um, but not really knowing where we were and um, what to do. And, you know, Shen, yeah. to, to, to Shen's credit, she did so much background work in the, in the meantime while she was going through the problem to work out what to do. Like she did a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of reading, a lot of, you know, um, did all sorts of stuff to, to actually fix herself um, to her credit, which... You know, and and admittedly, I was there just going, you know, just stop drinking. Mm -hmm. You know, how dare you? Yeah. How dare you do it again and again and again? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know. That doesn't really answer your question, but uh, all I all I can say is the person in the relationship on the other end of it um, feels, you know, it's a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. And and I reckon I reckon Glynis, one of the best things about finally reaching out right as me was I was able to get educated and informed as to what to say to Tim and blokes god bless it they can be a bit neanderthal like um and I found it helpful sorry Lee. I found it helpful to say to Tim I need you to do xyz you know you've got to appeal to that caveman and be very specific I need you to not have alcohol in this house I am struggling I don't know if that's something you can do or you have done, but oh mate, it's so bloody hard. Like possibly one of the most contradictory sounding things I learned in, in, in early sobriety was to be 
selfish. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on. Haven't I been a selfish asshole forever already? And they're like selfish in the sense that if your sobriety doesn't come first, you, you're you not going to make it. So you have mm. to make everything else. You know what I'm saying here, Lee? It's like, yeah. for example, um, if I didn't feel comfortable about Tim having alcohol in our home in that first year, I wasn't probably going to make it. I mean, I just wouldn't have. I don't know how the actual hell. So I had to verbalise to that to him and say, mate, seriously, I'm going to die. We've to, got to get this shit out of our house. It is poison. It has got to go. And we need to tell our friends the truth. You have got to stand next to me and we've got to go to war. Like literally the next 12 months will make or break whether I live. So there's no more, no, there's no more soft approaches. There's no more mucking about. And I said, if that can't be done, then I'd probably have to go. Like it was such a non-negotiable um, thing and I was very 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 fortunate that I was given that information and that education because had Tim not been alongside me I would have probably been forced to leave and people a lot of marriages don't survive someone else getting sober I'm not saying that to put a mocker on anything but because of this disparity in information and education or the one partner is actually a problem drinker who is not prepared to look at or deal with their own drinking so it's a really scary place to be, my darling. And we we can talk some more after today. I'd be really happy to. Um, but don't give up, hey? I, I believe the trick is in education and discussion. Mm. You know? Wow. Yeah. I just wanna yeah. <laughs> I just wanna add to that, Glynis. I think, you know, there's a couple of things that that Shana said that I think are important. Not in any particular order, right? But I'll just talk about them and open it up to to the table here um the first thing that i i, I got through what shana keeps saying consistently through a dialogue and we can now if you're watching the youtube clip here you can actually see that there's a togetherness the closeness right this is a relationship we're looking at here that is built on teamwork right my relationships of the past have been silo relationships i will take care of the business and take care of this stuff you take care of the kids and take care of that stuff and we might meet together in the night to have watch a video and then off we go in our silo um but i found recently that if i just go to the coffee shop sit down with Liza and say hey honey let's figure out um our maps this week what are we going to do this week um how are we going to spend our time who's going to look after this how are we going to spend our time now suddenly we've been a team right now if we've got somebody who's suffering from a death effect one angle that we could take is to not talk about alcohol is to actually say do you know what i'm not happy with our relationship like full stop and i want us to work together to be a better team because I don't feel like we're a team. Now, if you could work on that outside of the alcohol and you start to become a really effective team, now imagine turning around and telling them you've got a real problem because now you're a team, right? So maybe work on the team aspect of it before the alcohol stuff. Uh, the other thing that uh, came up there is the selfishness uh, thing. Um, yeah, we can never change anybody else, especially if they're suffering from a death effect. So never give up hope and keep, 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 keep working on yourself. Because if you keep working on yourself and keep being uh, the true you who we know you to be, he will recognize that and he will be turned on by that. Might be a little terrified about it as well, but he will be turned on by that. And everybody else around will be talking. Why are you glowing? Why are you like this? What has changed? So that's really important. And lastly, and I'll open it up to the table, I think consequences are really important. People don't talk about them enough, right? There needs to be a way, maybe this comes after you've built yourself up as a team but then there needs to be some non-negotiables there needs to be look honey i love you like so so much i'm indebted to you for where we are in our relationship and how far we've been however i'm telling you this is my number one priority right now and i need your full support this is what it looks like and if you can't give it to me i can't stay in this relationship i think for some neanderthal men they need that consequence it's like fuck I need to get my shit together. Otherwise this woman is going to end up with someone else. Cause she's looking hotter. She's looking smokier. She's like everything about her is changed. She's got this good positive energy. And she just told me yeah, self esteem. <laughs> and she just told me she's going to kick me out. If I don't shape up, like, yeah. you know, open that up. I mean, what, what do you think about consequences folks? I know it's a, a tough one, you know, to talk about. And do you know what, just while you girls are thinking of a question, I need to say that Tim and I are not a role model couple in every sense of the word we were so dysfunctional 
in the early days of our relationship, it was a joke. This is not a picture perfect marriage. It was profoundly, profoundly messed up for the first probably 10 years. We were always good mates, we always loved each other, but sobriety has given us peace. Anyway, so I just want to put it out there. It was not always beer and Skittles, pardon me. Mind you, like, like you said before, I mean, with sobriety comes a whole new raft of challenges and mm -hmm. like it changes everything. Like, you know, Shan's become almost a different person in a lot of ways. We talked and about that. I did, okay. No, 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 saying, no, carry on, carry on. No, no, I was just going to say, I spoke yeah. about how intimacy wise I struggle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously it doesn't just, doesn't just get better the day your partner stops drinking. You know, it, 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 it takes a long time and you've got to be prepared that, I mean, the way I look at it, you, you, you're there for the long haul. It's a marathon, not an egg and spoon race, you know. So, yeah. Was you ever worried, Tim, as she started to go through her changes, that, that she would become too good for you? Oh, and no one could be too good for me. There. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I just, um, I did think, um, you know, I, I guess I thought, well, you know, I've got to smarten my act up a bit too here because, yeah. you know, like, you know, I, I don't want to be, um, you know, certainly from an alcohol perspective, I don't want to be seen drunk in the pub all the time or something like that. Um, you know, so I've, I, I've certainly, um, you know, I used to, I used to be, you know, as good a drinker as the rest of them, you know, and just like an average, um, you know, country bloke, I suppose. But. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, but yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, I've certainly cut back on, on, on what I drink these days. And, you know, every now and then I'll have a bit of a, um, let go a bit with a few, of my, few mates in the right spot. But um, generally speaking, I, you know, I don't really drink through the week anymore. And, and certainly when I'm out with Shan, I've, I really, um, it's it's great. It's a credit to Shan that she's happy and content with me just having a couple of beers mm -hmm. when we go out, and we'll come home and, and that's it. You know, it's kind of weird. It's like sobriety has brought out whatever the bloody. It's like you have updates on your iPhone. We've been updated to whatever we are in two thousand and nineteen. It's like we're constantly evolving, um, and it's really interesting. Like. Timmy and I have a shared passion and vision to be a really positive example of what can happen within communities. Because he is such a stereotypical Aussie pie eating, beer drinking, rugby playing bloke. Mm. But I love the fact that Tim is a beacon to say, well, yeah, you can still actually be those things without it being next level, you know, crazy. And you can still support your alcoholic wife and you can still be whatever. Like I just... Timmy and I, we weren't able to have kids and that, that's something that nearly crushed both of us completely. And I carried a lot of guilt over that for a long, long time. Um, but he said to me the other day, he goes, we have an obligation because we can to do extraordinary things with whatever we've got left in this life. And it's ridiculous. Like, um, what people perhaps don't realise is that Every, I, f I believe every single one of us with, I shared a thing, I don't know if you saw Glennis on Instagram last night about broken, broken plates. Bro what's that bloody Japanese thing for where wabi, they... Wabi sabi. Wabi sabi love. Well, it's where they mend broken things with gold. Oh, oh, sorry. I was it's, thinking... That's yeah. okay. It doesn't matter. The point being that we don't have to be discarded because we're broken. Like each and every single one of us through our own shitty lives when we choose to, to to walk out of that and walk into freedom or whatever it might be that sounds really evangelistic but there's so much potential power behind every story and and i just i don't know like timmy and i have such a complete and utter conviction that we were blessed with a second opportunity to do amazing things to support and help people sounds so cheesy but we legitimately feel that way i know mm -hmm. but it's, but it's true. Tim, Tim has yeah, been a big part of that, you know. Tim, Tim's role, Tim's role can't be under understated here because no, not you know, at there, all. There, there are so many men who will not have a clue how to support 
a woman who will not listen to a woman. Like they need someone like Tim to talk to them and say, look, I was there, especially because he hasn't stopped drinking, but he's, he's made adjustments to it. Right. So part of the, part of the issue is, um, like when I, in my first marriage, when I stopped drinking, I, I said to my, uh, my wife back then, I really want you to stop drinking not to curtail it, not to cut it down a little bit. I really wanted her to stop because I couldn't see for the life of me how she could just have a few. I just, it just didn't register to me. And that was the case. So there were, it would be like, Look, I'm just going to have a few glasses of wine tonight. Okay. And I would be like, okay, but just remember our rules. Yeah, no problem. And then the bottle would go and then there'd be another bottle and then she'd forget even who I was, you know? So, so for me, like it was important that, there was a complete break. But for a lot of people, the fear and getting involved in these discussions with your partner is that fear that they're going to be asked to stop drinking. And they don't want to do it because as we know ourselves, it's like, it's, it's a big part of our social structure. Why would they want to give up? So that's another reason why they would be afraid to enter into dialogue. But if someone like Tim come along and says, well, actually, when your partner stops drinking alcohol, it has a really good effect on you because you have to shape up a little bit. It's almost like, the Apple Mac computer, every now and then the updates will come in the top right hand corner, like Shana said. And how many times do we press it and say, uh, update it tomorrow? And then eventually that wheel of death comes on your screen and everything, <laughs> everything freezes and you think, oh, why didn't I update it? You know, it's like by becoming, by becoming sober and stopping drinking, you are giving your partner an opportunity to also update themselves when they're ready. Um, and that doesn't mean they have to stop drinking alcohol forever. It just means they need to realize, okay, in certain circumstances, until, yeah. until my partner's ready, I need to change the goal. I need to move the goalposts a little bit. Do you know, Lee, I remember Timbo said to me in the early days, he goes, oh, actually, sweetheart, this is a bit awesome. He said, you've given me a get out of jail free card because Aussie blokes, as you know, Glynis, can be real dickheads about drinking with their mates. They can be just stupid. It's like, oh, you can't trust a bloke who says no to a beer. All of that rubbish that we've been programmed to believe, right? So Timmy goes, yeah, no, it's pretty good. No one gives me shit anymore because they know your story in full. And he goes, it's a bit like a get out of jail free card. And the side benefits of this for Timbo are that he, because he's cut back, because he's had to adjust his own lifestyle to not be a typical Aussie piss wreck bloke, He's now really fit and really active and really healthy. He always has been, but he's next level. Mm. And the best thing is I get to have a hot husband when everyone else has got a beer gut. Very excellent <laughs> bonus. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Oh. <laughs> so true. It's really, really nice. <laughs> Come on, admit it. Who's, who wants him to take his top off? He's doing his, he's doing his hair. <laughs> he's doing his hair. I want him to take his top off. <laughs> so there's lots, of, there's lots of sneaky side benefits if there's a bloke listening out there. You don't have to look like a beer gutted bloody norm. You can actually choose to be a healthy Australian male. I know it's a rad concept, but it's pretty good. Uh, Glynis, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, do you have any other questions you want to ask either Shana or uh, Tim? Uh, I know you've got to go. Um, Shana, you've got to go riding, right? Keep that, keep that happening. Um, can you just say hi to Andrew? You know Andrew, our marathon running Andrew. He's a striver. He's one of us, Shanna. He so, is um, amazing. He's a legend. Um, and quickly, I know you guys are oh, Australian. He's in this group, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. He's oh, going to be listening yeah. to this. Oh, is he listening now? He's not listening now, but he will listen in later for sure. He will just for sure. Andrew is the total bloody legend. He is a legend. He found our group to be super supportive and as an honouring thing of that, he ran a marathon oh, to yeah. race. But it's his beautiful, hello, Andrew, I love you. Amazing bloke. <laughs> yeah, he actually, he, actually, he actually left you a message. What did he say? Uh, let me read oh, it. No. Um, I hope the podcast goes well, Lee. Shana has been working bloody hard over here, all off her own back without any financial support. I think oh. she might be starting to feel the pressure of not being able to do more. She has and is helping so many rural Australians and her determination oh. and courage is truly amazing. Oh, <laughs> oh. that's yeah. beautiful. See, that's, what were you going to ask, Glynis? Because I'll cry. <laughs> uh, I know, it's really emotional. I've got a few questions, but that's okay. Um, touching on no, what Andrew meant, mentioned, um, 
You must be really tired at the moment, Shanna. You've been doing so much and I just want to know how that feels. How progressive does it feel or not? Do you feel like you're, you're making waves? Because I think you're doing an amazing job. I know, I, I know full well the extraordinary impact that we are having in rural Australia. I know that. I, like, it's... I'm aware. I'm also very, 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 it's always very necessary for me to always say, I don't think I'm an extraordinary person. I think the reason this is working is because I'm so bloody ordinary and so representative of so many of us. I don't think I'm anything friggin', I don't think I'm a queen or a slayer or any of that bullshit. I just think I'm just a regular person, a regular bush girl. Um, and I keep that humility front and centre always. Um, it's just important for me to always say that. Um, I feel like, I honestly, Glynis, I feel like the luckiest girl in Australia to be able to use such a broken story to relate. Look at the friends I'm making across the bloody world. It's extraordinary. It, I think it's a great, I think being a flippant alcoholic who nearly died is the, turns out to be the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Um, I do get exhausted, I do, do get tired, I do get frustrated, I do want to go and parachute into Parliament House and grab our leaders by the scruff of the neck and say, what are you doing? Like, why can't you help me? I get frustrated by that. I get frustrated by the wheels of our health system and how slowly they turn and how backwards it is. That That's a real, that's something I have to work on all the time. Um, I get sick of I get sick of the financial insecurity. That's that that just requires faith all the time. I have to just keep trusting that it will come. Um, but honestly, mate, mostly I just feel stupidly thankful. What do you What do you feel, Timbo? Yeah, not much. Oh, shut up, God, he's, such a <laughs> he's like ten minutes. This has been twenty. Yeah, 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 ten minutes. I think it's up. No? This, this is, is going to end. This is Aussie humour. <laughs> yeah. Tim, Tim, you have our permission to leave whenever you want, buddy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I better get going. Actually, I'm probably running a bit late. So. <laughs> yeah, no worry. You shoot um, off. Go on. We'll all talk about you when you've gone. Yeah, when, when, on. Hey, Tim, when you've gone, we'll be like. Fucking hell, he's not supporting her, is he? He's just fucked <laughs> up. What a jerk. <laughs> what a typical Australian man he is. Nice to meet you. Tim. <laughs> See you later. See you, Take care. Thank you. All right. Love you. I really love you. Oh, my back. Hey. I was trying to hear that out. Um, that, that hey, Shanna, Shanna, <laughs> Shanna. What, what a nice ass he's got. Oh, I know. Ah, he must be working out. <laughs> Poor Tim, bro. God, he's beautiful, isn't he? Um, Thank you for doing that. That was not planned, but I'm yeah, glad you... Yeah, no, it was helpful. Go on, Clinic. You've got some more questions for Shana? Please, go for it. Oh, my other thing that popped into my head, um, for those people who don't know, um, Tim and Shana are Australia's best auntie and uncle. And I just want to know if you... Uh, maybe the kids are a little bit young yet. But have you started mentioning anything? Any discourse about? Oh, you know what, Glenis? That is, oh, that's a really scary thing for me. Um, my eldest nieces and nephews, so I've got a group of them who live far away who are now between the ages of 14 and 22. My brother's got six children. Um, yeah, we've, we've now spoken about it. Um, it was a bit awkward. It was taken out of my hands. Um, my family spoke about it with them first, which I didn't... I, I wish I'd had the opportunity to sit down with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's kind of weird. I actually... Uh, that, that's a real source of discomfort for me is... is kids, are, kids are kids. I, I, I don't think kids should be burdened with adult stuff too early. Um, and I'm really... One of the reasons I do what I do through Sober in the Country, and you've, you've heard me say this, Glenis, is because I don't have any children to humiliate, right? Um, I wouldn't do this if I had kids because I'd be too bloody conscious of their needs and what would they say about their crazy mummy, you know, who speaks publicly about being an alcoholic, blah, blah. Recovered. Controversial, hey, Lee? Love saying that. Um, 
yeah, I, I don't, we just, the, the little ones coming through, oh, I just hope and pray for the right words to say to them when the time comes. Um, but yeah, it's, it stresses me out a fair bit actually, because I'm conscious of the impact. Because I'm getting pretty high, this sounds really wankerish, but I'm getting quite high profile now. <laughs> and it's like, oh, me. Oh, that's funny. But yeah, I'm really conscious of the impact on my family and friends. So, ah, <sighs> mm. Well, you will be high profile after coming on our fantastic yeah. podcast. <laughs> I mean, look, how high, look how highly polished it is. So polished. <laughs> Guess what? I've been asked to go and speak at the Sydney Opera House next year. You guys find a bloody outfit, eh? Hey? Yeah, I like it. Dig deep into the coffers to find some fancy outfit there. Come on, listeners. <laughs> Come on, listeners. Find some money so she can buy an outfit. <laughs> oh, um, yes. So we're in the final stages now, um, Glynis and Stella and Lee. Um, someone asked before about funding. Um, Stella, yeah. So. Um, Within, we're hoping that um, by the time Australian Story goes to air, Lee, Australian Story is a very well regarded documentary program over here. It's a bit like your BBC. Right. Our ABC, they're doing a documentary. So be prepared for lots of hideous close ups of my battered face um, at the end of November. And the plan is that we will have the not for profit launched by then. Um, and somehow between now and then, I'm trying to get some structure in place um, as to how we can effectively raise funds. So uh, I don't know. We'll just it will just keep chipping away. I, I've got full faith it'll happen. But as yet, the government haven't come through with a single bit of support, mm. which is astonishing to me because I know that if I was doing in the dr in the drug space, I would have been knighted by now yeah, yeah. it's, like it's they don't extraordinary want to touch, it's like they don't want to touch you with a barge pole politically do they you know they don't want to touch me with a barge pole and I what, what politician in australia is going to curry any favor trying to ban alcohol <laughs> and isn't it funny i've said to it i could say it until i was purple and blue in the face i'm not here to demonize alcohol yeah, yeah. But i am here to call out the fact that we have got many country women and men like glennis like my favourite rant, you know, you girls have heard me say this, Glennis. I'm like, we've got to support the people in the outback because they're mm. feeding and clothing the bloody nation and they can't get help and that is absolutely not okay. Mm. But, yeah, we we treat... Anyway, don't start me. Okay. <laughs> Glynis, Stella, last chance. Any more questions? Uh, no, I haven't got any more questions. Uh, I am just can't wait to see Australian Story and thanks, Shana. Thank you so oh. much. Thank you, beautiful lady, for <laughs> tuning in from home. Like, can you send me a friend request? I would love to keep in touch. Sure, sure. Seriously. I'd love that. Oh, Thanks, Anna. Awesome. <laughs> I just saw a guy walk no, past. No, that's, no, that's, that, he's, he's awesome. He, that's my 17-year-old. It's oh, um, quarter past. Oh. Hi, it's only 7.15 here. They're all just waking up. Yeah, and just waking and up. Look, look how well trained the next generation is. Huh? <laughs> Guess your drink. I like it. I love it. All right, Shana, I'm going to bring it to a close. I just want to say um, a huge thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, you're not an ordinary chick from the outback or the bush or whatever you want to call it. You are a phenomenal woman, a power of strength, and an absolute massive inspiration to everybody out there. So keep doing what you're doing. I know it's bloody hard, right? I know it's hard, especially when you're trying to help people and balance that as well with kind of like, you know, the financial side of things. So uh, reach out to me on email. Maybe I can have some ideas to kind of help you with that because I'm trying to do the same thing as well myself because if we become financially free, we'll be able to do this full time. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. Good luck with the Australian story. And please give Tim a really big kiss for him coming on. I think his insights were very, very important. So uh, thank you very much for coming on the Alcohol Condition podcast. Oh, uh, thank you, Lee. And thank you for what you're doing. I might, I can't believe I'm not on Strive. I'm such an idiot. I will join that. Um, but collectively, we're making a difference. And it's just lovely. I, you're going to have to be a friend now. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> Cool. You go. You go and you go and ride your horse, and uh, 
and I'll, I'll go and dream of what it's like to ride a horse. Right. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you Talk later.